Hi, I assume you landed on this video because you are interested in software and medical devices. If so, this is the right place for you. In this short course, my goal is to give you practical tips when working with software in medical devices. At the end of this video, I will share tips about software risk management, which is painful if you don't get it right. I'm Christian Kessner, and I started my career as embedded software engineers in the early 90s. After a couple of years, I moved into the medical device field where I've done sterilization equipment, transplantation devices, wound care therapy, and much more. Seven years ago, I joined the project team authoring IEC 62304. I also work as lead auditor. This ensures I have insights from both sides of the fence. This short course applies to you if you are developing a medical device software that is an app, software as a medical device, or embedded software. As a medical device software developer, you need to comply with the standard IEC 62304. For this short course, my goal is to give you inspiration on how to comply with the standard without killing your creativity. I will give you a jump start into the wonderful world of IEC 62304. Number one, I will show you that the world does not need to be waterfallish. Two, I will also show how you can manage legacy products without doing everything from scratch. Three, I will give you a few tips about how version control can do more than just keeping track of your source code. And lastly, number four, you will learn how software risk is calculated. So let's get started. The general idea with standard is to establish a common way of thinking which can be recognized by various stakeholders such as regulatory authorities. When a standard is recognized by authorities, it means that if you comply with the standard, you will most likely also be complying with applicable regulatory requirements. IEC 62304 is a process standard, which means you will not find details like performance or screen resolution requirements. What you will find is a list of requirements and activities you should car carry out throughout your development cycle. The standard is structured in a very sequential way, which implies a waterfallish development method. But there are no requirements in the standard forcing you to apply a specific development method. You're fully free to use whatever method you want to, as long as you acknowledge the process approach and don't skip any activities in the standard. Let's take a look at the key elements of the standards. We are talking about development, risk management, configuration management, problem resolution, and maintenance. Each of the processes are divided into activities with the development process having the most activities. And no, this is not rocket science. If you have been working in a mature organization developing software, whether that be in defense or mobile phone industry, you will find that the ways of working are similar, but use different names. But in the medical device industry, we are obsessed with safety. Because in the medical device, a software bug is not only blue screen, it can literally be blue screen of death. Basically because a bug can kill someone. Back to the standard. A nice thing with this standard is that the number of activities you need to do depends on how harmful your product can be. This is decided with help of software safety classification, which I will explain to you later. But the flow through the standard is the same, but the rigor is different depending on your classification. This graphical overview visualizes the scope of the standard. Blue boxes are in scope, Gray are out of scope. The arrows between blue and gray is where there is an information exchange. The first arrow gives you inputs about what and when. When is, for example, pre-releases for various purposes before final release. What can be functional requirements such as information to, to display on screens or alarm management. It can also be hardware constraints, so like do you have one or more CPUs available? Or should communication happen over USB or Ethernet? In the standard, there's a clause speaking of software requirement content, but there's nothing about how you document your requirements. 
You can capture requirements in any way you want to. It can be tickets, stories, wiki pages, or advanced requirement management tools. It's entirely up to you. But please remember a couple of formal requirements you need to consider. For example, in your system verification, you must reference a specific set of requirements. This is what I call a baseline. Requirements shall also be reviewed and approved, so please make sure your setup can support you in this work. Traceability is also a requirement. Ideally, your choice of requirement management also supports you with traceability to verification. In addition to when releases are expected, we also need to plan for content, purpose and how to deliver a release. The expectations are most likely different if you are releasing for usability test, clinical study or final release for production or upload to App Store. Here we are back to our obsession with safety. To develop a safe software, we need to have input about hazardous situations to understand what we must avoid. Very often this input also includes risk-related requirements, for example to display a detailed warning when high blood pressure is detected. The highlighted processes are supporting the development process. As already mentioned, the risk management process helps you to develop a safe software. The configuration management process supports you in keeping track of information, changes and source code. And last but not least, the problem resolution process, which manages issues with your software. And hopefully, this is your least used process. The bulk of your development work will be in the highlighted section, where you can see the various development activities that will take place in the order in which they should ideally happen. However, it is unlikely your development work will happen exactly like this and your development method should allow you to be adaptive as your knowledge evolves over time. The key to being adaptive is to be good at working with changes. But what happens if we take smaller steps and use information from previous steps and adjust into the next step? Let's look at agile principles with the help of Scrum. Scrum development principle embraces changes. But you might feel there's a mismatch between the waterfall approach in the standard compared to working with agile methods. There's no need to be worried. Working with backlogs, stories and sprints, sprint planning can be compared with when eating an elephant, take one bite at a time. Let's take a look at an example from the standard and compare the two ways of working. You need to verify your quality of your requirements by, for example, verifying that they do not contradict one another are expressed in terms that avoid ambiguity, are traceable to system requirements or other sources. If you review a Scrum story before it gets implemented, you do it by taking one byte at a time. The wordings might be different, but you certainly don't want contradictions and ambiguity in your stories. If I simplify things, you verify requirements on a story-based level instead of verifying your complete backlog of requirements. If we now compare with a waterfall approach, you typically aim for having nearly a full set of requirements and then you go for a review. In this later example, you will not verify as frequently as you do in Scrum, but you will spend more time in every review. So you can work with Agile principle and meet the requirements of the standard. It's only a question of how you have chosen to meet the requirements of the standard. In case you are into agile development, there's a very good technical report from Amy. I would recommend this report as a very reliable source of information and guidance. Enjoy your reading. Let us return to the software safety classification. The classification is divided into A, B and C. A is the lowest class, which means that the software is not likely to contribute to hazardous situations. While C is the highest class, which is applicable when there is a likelihood of a serious injury or even death. If your software is linked to risk with high severity, your classification will go up. In the standard, there is a flowchart for the classification process. The basic idea is that high severity should drive the rigor of your development process. If you dislike the outcome of your, of your classification, 
you're free to go back and change the intended use or the medical device. You could, for example, reallocate features from software to hardware, or even easier, you could change your requirements. There is, of course, much more to talk about when it comes to theory and general structure of the standard. But for now, I would continue with other goals which I believe you have more practical use of, so let's kick off with planning. If you search the standard for the word planning, you will find many hits. I've seen several projects where this results in far too many plans, which is waste of time and a high way to audit observation. Waste of time because you spend too much time in just administrating plans, and audit observation because there's a high chance that your plans are outdated or simply not telling the same story. Instead of making your life hard, I suggest you keep it simple and start with a single plan, a single source of truth. You should only start splitting the project into different plans if it adds value to your project team. This could, for example, be if you have a separate test team, then it could make sense to have a dedicated verification plan. The plan is a very good place to explain how the team is structured and how you interact with your quality management system. I consider it more as a tactical document these days. For example, if you want to use agile methods and you're stuck with waterfall procedures, then the software development plan is a perfect place to explain and to document your specific approach. Let's take a look at an example of what interacting with a quality management system could be. Many quality management systems are developed with a physical piece of paper in mind. You could call it a document-based mindset. Software information is typically not organized based on physical papers. Information is structured based on other aspects, such as architectural or functional considerations. And preferably, the information is kept where it supports the developer the most, in the source code. There's a requirement in the standard about detail design. The conservative approach to this requirement is to write a traditional document. But since you already version control your source code, why not let some of your documentation coexist with the code instead of forcing the information into a traditional paper document? Here it's up to you. Either you keep the information in the source file, or you decide to extract information from source files and create traditional documents. Your way of working with information and documents can be explained in the software development plan. Because there's certainly no need to convert all information to paper documents, but you need to identify where it can be found and how you control it. In this example, I've used Doxygen format for the comments. In case you really, really must, you can also easily extract the comments to traditional document formats. But when you later maintain the code, the documentation is available where it supports the developer the most, and it's also much easier to maintain. Just a quick recap. All projects are different, and the standard procedure cannot describe all projects. Make sure the plan helps you in your work. For this video, I've zoomed in on a few practical aspects with planning, but please don't forget timing aspects, such as what and when you need to deliver something. If you have a product already on the market and need to get in compliance with the standard, the legacy clause is there for you. Some people might find this clause also convenient for new development, they skip implementing the standard, and then by magic, there's a legacy product because it was developed before applying the standard. This is both cheating and inefficient. I will soon tell you why. But let's start with how the clause is intended to be used. The legacy clause starts with risk management activities. The advantage of having a product already on the market is that you have access to post-market information. You're expected to use this information as input to your risk management activities and the expected output of this step is identification of hazardous situation and software safety classification. Based on the classification, you're now supposed to do a gap analysis and assess what deliverables are missing compared to if you had implemented the standard as intended from the beginning. You have now identified a list of deliverables which are missing compared to the standard. Review the list and prepare a plan to fill the gaps in timely manner. If, for example, detail design is missing, it probably doesn't make sense to run away and generate detail design just because it's missing. 
it's most likely better to fill this gap when updates are implemented. And this is then what you write in your plan. Now is the moment of truth. With the knowledge you now have, can you justify the continued use of your product from a safety perspective? If yes, document your conclusion and deliver according to your gap closure plan. If not, worst case, you need to stop the continued use of the medical device, including your software. But let's hope it's only half bad and it can be managed by correcting a few software bugs and re-release the software. Back to the cheating part. From the point in time when you claim legacy, you need to comply with the full standard. This means that sooner or later you must spend the resources you initially tried to avoid. One could argue and say this is now easier because you know the end result. But based on my experience, it's much easier to maintain a properly developed product compared to retrospectively patching it into compliance. Just let me give you an example. Assume you didn't run a full system verification. When you now run a full verification, you find, uh, find alarms which are not working in all conditions. So what should you do? Well, either you can pre pretend like nothing happened, which is a bad idea. You simply must correct the software and release a new version. Worst case, I'm sorry to say, you may even have to contact all your customers and tell them to stop using your medical device. Now you know how to deal with legacy software and please stay away from cheating. Let's talk about configuration management. I would say that the software project usually has more configuration items to control than all documents together in a full development project. If you look at the definition of a configuration item, it says entity that can be uniquely identified at a given reference point. In the software domain, a given reference point can be down to hours or even minutes. And this is very different if you compare with a document which is typically released with help of a signature and at a much lower pace. Maybe you ask yourself, what is a configuration item? Configuration item can be many things. It can be pre-compiled libraries, build files, source code, compiler settings, basically any piece of information needed to create your deliverable, including documentation. One example of configuration management is version control systems, which can support you with traceability. In this example, you see two branches for bug fixes. By using branches, you can easily review how specific bug has been resolved. In the bigger picture, version control also supports you in reviewing changes between releases. This is super helpful when you're determining how much regression testing needs to be done or what you should put into your release note. But it's not only practical aspects in gathering data and providing traceability support. Correctly implemented configuration management can also support process aspects of your development work. Let's break down the flow in a couple of steps. The first step is a decision step. For example, when you decide to implement a change request, you can use roles to define who can create branches and use this to control when implementation work starts in response to an approved change request. The next step is the implementation step. If you define in your procedures that you should always work on a branch and never directly in the main, this assures that you always have traceability back to the reason why you are implementing something. The third step is about verification. This is a great step to implement a peer review and a good practice is that you're not merging back your own code to the main. The verification step is also a step where you can get a lot of compliance work integrated directly into your workflow. If you prepare good work instructions on how to merge back branches to main, you can most cover most of the content of the clauses I've listed here on the screen. The documentation part of this would end up as information pieces in your configuration management system. And as I mentioned in the planning section, it will be then doc documented, but not as traditional documents. If you haven't done it yet, spend some time in looking for good configuration management tools which can satisfy your needs. And please make sure you validate the system and use them as much as you ever can. I assume you have some basic understanding of risk management. If you don't, 
I recommend you watch the videos about risk management here at medicaldevicehq.com. One of the most misunderstood statements in this field is that probability of occurrence of harm should be set to 100% just because you're working with a software. I can tell you that statement is wrong. Probability of occurrence of harm can be split up into two components, P1 and P2. The probability of occurrence of the hazardous situation is P1. P2 is the likelihood of that the hazardous situation will lead to harm. When people are talking about probability of occurrence of harm and claim it shall be 100%, they refer to P1. But also this assumption can be challenged. Let's have a look at an example where a software is used to recommend the right medication. In this example, we assume that 1% of the patients are allergic to drug A and we have five different drugs to choose from. The software fails by choosing wrong medication. So what is PO for this risk? The right answer is, it depends. It depends on the type of software failure we're dealing with. Either the software failure results in randomly selecting one of the five drugs, or the failure always results in choosing drug A. For the sake of safety, we could assume that drug A always will be selected. But if we're talking about random errors, the likelihood for the software to only select drug B or any other drug is as high as it is for only selecting drug A. This results in a different scenario. In the random drug example, I still agree that the software failure always will happen, but I cannot predict the outcome. So in this particular case, if the hazardous situation is that drug A is incorrectly chosen, the likelihood of the hazardous situation occurs is 20%. And it's quite a difference. To summarize, if you're working a lot with software, please do yourself a favor and start using P1 and P2. As long as you stay with PO, you will find yourself in a very difficult situation. I will of course go into more depth on this topic in the full course, where I also will explain how you work with risk control measures in software to reduce P1 and eventually even P2. Thank you for watching this short course. Do you need templates to give you inspiration or do you require more knowledge on software and medical devices? You can find free templates or you can sign up for the full Introduction to Software Development and IC62304 course here on medicaldevicehq.com. If you don't want to miss out on more premium content from our online courses, Subscribe to the medicaldevicehq.com channel by clicking on the subscribe button. You will be kept up to date with what videos we publish and you will also help us reaching out to more people that work in the medical device industry. So go on and subscri subscribe now. Thank you.